Hi, everyone. everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to our podcast on saying goodbye to your aches and pains. And pains. Um, before, before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements I'd like to make. Um, one, one of the things, things is if you want to ask questions, questions I encourage you to do so. Just, just type in the questions if you're watching online. Just, just go to lifespa.com and click on the first article below titled Episode 28, to Say Goodbye to Your Aches and Pains. This is the viewing page for the podcast, and here you can submit questions in the gray box below the video or just watch the podcast live. Do not type your questions. Um, did I type, type in your questions on the YouTube page because we won't see those, okay? To ask your questions verbally, you need to be listening on your phone. To listen to your phone, dial, um, to listen on your phone, just dial 425-440. 5100 and enter the pin, pin number 124-337-POUND. Again, that's to listen on the phone, that's 425-440-5100 and the pin number is 124-337-POUND. And that's if you want to ask questions live, which is fun. Uh, just press star 2 and I'll, I'll encourage you to do that along the way as well. If, if I, I call on you uh, in a live, live call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see where your cell phone's registered, so I'll call you in the city and the state and the last name of which your cell phone's registered, so I'm gonna be your exact name, so tune into that. Um, there's no difference or preference for me whether I answer the questions live or you type them in, either way, it's fine. If you registered for this event, uh, this live event, you'll receive an email tomorrow with a recap of the podcast as well as a link to watch or listen or download the podcast at your convenience. Uh, and you can sign up for this or any other podcast at LifeSpot.com under the Learn tab by clicking Podcasts under the Events column. So you can check out all of our, our podcasts as well. Welcome, Welcome to, to this month's, month's podcast, podcast on saying goodbye to aches and pains. Okay. Okay, okay everyone, we, we will be right, right with, with you. We're just having, having a couple of technical, technical issues, issues so, so just, just hang, hang on, on one second. second. Okay, okay, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay. There might be a little bit of reverb on the audio, on the playback. There shouldn't be a problem with that. So just so you all know about that. Um, so anyway, welcome to this podcast on 
how, how to, to say goodbye to your aches and pains. And, and I'm super, super excited, excited about, about this uh, podcast and I want to dive into that in just a second. Uh, before, before I do that, I want to remind you all of our next uh, video podcast, which is called Brain Lymph Connection for Better Mood and Memory. It's on March 14th uh, at 5.30 as well. So much exciting, amazing research being done right now on the lymphatic system in the microscopic lymphs in our brain, how they relate to anxiety and depression and mood and autoimmune conditions and all the things that Ayurveda has been saying for so many years that the lymph is such a critical piece of the puzzle is now being borne out by modern science. It's just really incredible and I'm so excited to share this with you uh, next month. So don't miss that one for sure. Okay, here we go. This, um, this, this, this call, this podcast is really about how to get rid of your aches and pains. Now, this is something that I've done for 30 years as a chiropractor. I was the director of player development for the New Jersey Nets, where I did all their rehab, worked with their strength coach, and, uh, and was sort of the nutritionist and designed their meals and their nutrition and did all the rehab for them. And when I got to the New Jersey Nets, they weren't doing so well. They were the number one most injured team in the league. And after doing some of the biomechanical support that I gave them and some of the, the tools that I'm going to teach you to do today, um, we became the, the, the number three least injured team in the league in just a year and a half. So that was a pretty cool accomplishment, I thought. And uh, I worked with many athletes over the years. Uh, Martina and Billie Jean King did the forward to my first book, Body, Mind, Sport. I've been involved in athletics and sports my entire life. Um, and learned a ton about how to get people well very, very fast. And, um, and uh, you, you know, know, one of my, my mottos was, was to get people better in three days. days. I mean, the idea that you have to come back for six weeks and on and on and on was never really my cup of tea. Sort of similar to how I like to give herbs, to get on, get better, get off. Create self-sufficiency was my goal. So that was really the, the point of uh, what I, when I was in chiropractic practice and actually doing chiropractic, I'm not doing that anymore. So I really feel like, you know, I just have this compassion, this, this, this compulsion to, to teach you what I learned in all those years and hopefully give you the skills to keep yourselves healthy. So I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit about what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually take our camera over to my table. I'm going to show you some really cool things that you can do and some of the logic behind biomechanics and why we get out of whack and where this pain comes from in the first place. Then I'll come back here and we will uh, answer some questions and, and go from there. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the philosophy that I like to use and then some of the available therapies that are out there for pain. Um, the philosophies that I like are very simple. You know, this is an Ayurvedic philosophy. Blood comes into cells and waste goes out. If the blood isn't getting in and the, or the waste isn't getting out, bad things happen. That's just the way it is in every aspect of our health. Okay, lymphatic drainage, for example, we're going to talk about next month, from the brain is critically important for so many things. Waste, waste removal, lymphatic drainage from the muscles is critically important. Remember, your lymphatic system is a pumping system that moves from muscular contractions. So exercise and muscular movements are sort of critical, really critical. And if those muscles are in spasm or too tight, let's say you get injured, muscle goes into spasm. The blood can't get into that muscle as well as it could because it's in spasm, right? And therefore the waste can't get out of that muscle because the waste is pumped out by muscular contractions. And if you're in a spasm, you're not getting muscular contractions. Contraction. So as a result, the muscle loses blood in and also waste out. As a result of that, the muscles basically sort of lay down a protective tissue, a protective tissue that doesn't require blood supply. In other words, it's like, it's like watering water your lawn. lawn. If you water your lawn, lawn you get nice green grass. grass. If you don't water your lawn, you get crabgrass. Crabgrass is green, and it works, but it's a tough version of grass. In the body, in the muscles, it's the exact same thing. Blood comes in and waste comes out. But if the blood is not getting in or the waste is not getting out as well as it could because there's a muscle spasm or an injury or postural stress or tension, then the blood can't get in, the waste can't come out, and the muscles sort of lay down crabgrass, which is a tougher version of a muscular tissue. 
And, and as, as a result, result though, as, as a result, result, the muscles, muscles become stiffer and, and more rigid. rigid. They, they literally, literally, your muscles are sort of like ropes of twines of a rope, and they slide like little twines of a rope, right? right? And, when and when they get super tight, they, the twines actually lose their blood supply. And then they lay down a little protective crabgrass or scar tissue in and around all those little twines. And it can stick the muscles together so they don't slide as much. Literally, there's what's called increased resistance in the ability for the muscle to contract because it's got all this scar tissue in between it, right? It makes sense, right? So, so if you have, as we age, we get a lot of fibrous tissue or scar tissue or crabgrass buildup in the muscles. And as a result, they lose their elasticity. So if you then use them or move too fast or fall, those muscles instead of being rubber bands, they're, they're very rigid ropes and the twines of the rope can tear. And, and that's, that's how you get, get sort of a torn muscle, muscle or and then more inflammation, less blood, blood supply, and, and then more layering of scar tissue and rendering the body ultimately more stiff and more rigid and, and the muscles more brittle. That's, that's sort of simply how it works. So, so the reversal of that is pretty straightforward. If you can get in there and break up that scar tissue, you can, you can increase blood supply. supply. And, and therefore, therefore get the muscles, muscles to start to contract, contract again and, and start, start to pump lymphatic fluid out and blood in. And, and that's, that's a very, very simple technique. There's techniques like active release technique, uh, muscle, muscle activation, activation technique that work very much along the lines of actually mechanically breaking up the scar tissue. This is what I did when I was with the New Jersey Nets and I did all my life as a sports sort of chiropractor, not that I only work with athletes, anybody with back pain, if you break up the scar tissue, muscle restores elasticity, waste can move out of the body, good things happen. So, so, so tech techniques like active release technique are techniques that actually break up that scar tissue. And I, when I was with the New Jersey Nets, um, you know, I would do pre-game treatments before uh, every game and at halftime for all the players. And they loved it because muscles become, become tight and you have a lot of scar tissue, there's increased resistance. So it's harder for the muscles to contract, it takes more energy. So if you're, doing their, if you're working on their legs, they don't jump as freely, it's more resistance. So if I could actually break up the scar tissue in the muscles in their legs or in there for their shooting muscles, then all of a sudden they were, it would felt like instead of shooting a basketball, they were shooting a volleyball. And it was so much easier for them to jump higher and move quicker. And also, most importantly, they didn't get injured because their, their tissues and their muscles were more elastic. That's how we went from the number three most injured team in the league to the third least injured team in the league in just a year and a half. That's because of that strategy. Now, uh, the technique, active release technique, is a technique that I use, developed by a very good friend of mine, Dr. Mike Leahy, who uh, works with Denver Broncos and many other teams uh, uh, using this technique. So you can find someone in your area to do that kind of technique. Uh, the uh, muscle activation techniques are great, similar. Chiropractic is interesting because that's sort of, you know, the, the adjustment of the bone. Now you got to think about that for a second. If the bones get, um, if the bones, if the muscles are clamping down on the joints, then the joints will eventually lose its blood supply as well. And the joint will lay down protective scar tissue around the joint capsule and the joints can get what's called fixated. It can lose its range of motion, its mobility and its blood supply can be somewhat compromised and you can get rigidity and lacking of elasticity within the spine, within the joint, within your shoulder, whatever joint you're working on. So the idea of a chiropractic adjustment is actually get in there and sort of break up the scar tissue inside the joint to increase blood supply getting uh, into the joint and lymphatic and venous drainage away from the joint. Same exact rules apply, blood in, waste out. Um, so that's what a chiropractic adjustment is all about, which is great. Massage, of course, does a little bit of both. It can really, they can massage the joints really deeply and get great benefit of blood circulation enhancement around the joint, and they can get great, great muscular blood circulation into the muscles. I'm a big fan of actually, you know, doing a, a little bit more of a, when you have pain, to do a little bit more of a specific 
work on the exact muscles that have gone into spasm so you're a little bit more precise in your methods, but a really good massage therapist can, he knows how to do that as well and it can be another fantastic technique because we're addressing the cause. There are herbs that do that as well. One of my favorite herbs is an herb called Basuela. Basuela is a herbal formula that's been shown to be a powerful natural uh, inhibitor for some of the powerful inflammatory pathways. Um, it's been shown to actually break up the scar tissue, this, this crab grass around the muscles and reinstate blood supply into the muscle and create elasticity, which what I love about it is that as you get as you, um, uh, you take something like the Basuela, you can get on it, increase blood supply, break up scar tissue, increase lymphatic flow, drainage, and then get off of it. So people can get on and get better and get off. I really love it from that perspective. MSN, methyl sulfonyl methane, another classic sort of Western nutrient comes from extracts of broccoli and things like that to create this kind of sulfur compound that has a similar effect on breaking up scar tissue and increasing blood supply into the joints. Those are my sort of two favorites that have more of a tendency to create elasticity and help get you off the the herbs as opposed to becoming dependent on it. Um, so those are some things to, to think about. You know, in Ayurveda, there are Ayurvedic massages uh, for the lymphatic system. Uh, we have a lymphatic massage oil, which is really great for joints and oils are really great because they tend to penetrate into the joint. The herbs that are carried by the oils can penetrate into the joint. And again, do exactly the same thing, increase blood supply, break up scar tissue, and hence support lymphatic drainage to allow the joint to do what it was designed to do. Muscles contract, move the joint, pump blood in, move waste out, and good things happen. And that's what it's really all about. What happens though, is that it's not just an injury um, that can cause a muscle to go in spasm. It can be way more subtle and insidious than that. It can be from sitting at a desk for a long period of time for days and weeks and months and years on end. It can be from, um, it can be from poor posture, from driving too much, uh, repetitive activities, you know, that you do the same thing again and again and again can overuse certain muscles and, and not support other muscles. And that's what I want to share with you. And when muscles become posturally overtaught, what can happen is they entrap the lymphatic drainages, but they also entrap nerves. So inside all these little twines of the rope, you have nerves that go through them like that. And when those nerves go through, they can be entrapped or grabbed onto by a muscle and entrap a nerve and cause nerve issues and nerve pain and things like that. And this is where I really think acupuncture really shines because they have a tendency to get in there and track some of those nerve channels and help to relax some of those nerves and allow them to be more elastic and, and uh, allow the nerves and the muscles to sort of relax. I think the combination of uh, Either, uh, either uh, you know, acupuncture and chiropractic and some muscle therapy is a really cool kind of con you know concept and combination of therapies to really bring the body back into balance. So that's a little bit of in a nutshell what I want to share with you. And now what I want to do is I want to go over and I want to talk to you about I want to show you um, some of these techniques and some of the strategies and some of the postural things that get us into trouble in the first place. So I'm going to switch the camera over to our table and then um, I'm going to be there in a second and we'll continue this discussion. So one of the things that, that I find to be so important when it comes to understanding how the body gets out of whack is our posture. You know, when I was in chiropractic college, one of the most, one of the, 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 the state board questions was, what is the most important postural muscle of the body? And everybody would take a guess and nobody really knew for sure. But the answer was your calf muscle. That was considered the most important postural muscle of the body, which seems sort of weird, right? But when you think about the postural muscle of the calf, if your calf muscles are very, very tight back here, what are they gonna do? They are gonna lock your knees, right? So if you're standing up straight, and your calf muscles are super tight, you're, they're gonna lock and you're gonna go like this. You're gonna tink forward just like that. That's what happens when your calf muscles get tight. Now, if I'm like in this position, then 
I'm looking at the floor, which is not very wonderful. So my back muscles and my middle back muscles and my neck are gonna have to pull me off the floor and work extra hard to antidote gravity because my postural muscles have me taut back. Does that make sense to you? So that's really critically important is to understand how this whole thing works because a lot of us have problems not in our low back, not in our neck and shoulders, or even, or, or even our middle back, but it's actually down below. So what I want to teach you today is how to create a platform for really good stability. And this resolves most of your low back problems and, and it can have, make a great dent on some of the neck issues. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay. So here's how it works. Um, even though they say the most important posture muscle is your calf muscle, it's really not your calf muscle. The most important postural muscle, this is your calf muscle here, but the muscles on the front of your leg are a bunch of little muscles. They're about that big, and the calf is about that big. So these little guys on the front are designed for like climbing cave walls and proprioception and running on rocks and, and doing, you know, climbing and, 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 and using your feet with some sort of dexterity. That's what, your, your front muscles, your anterior tibial muscles and your posterior tibial muscles and your flexor muscles on the front side of your leg. We don't use those any longer very well. We stick our foot in a shoe and we walk and we push off and our calf muscle does all the work. So we have really, really huge calf muscles and really, really weak muscles in the front of the leg. So when the muscles in the front of the leg become, become weaker, the calf naturally gets tighter and we go like this. And we are basically taunted and tipped forward like that. So the very first thing that we need to do to resolve this problem is to actually strengthen the muscles of the front of your leg. And that's really important and really very, very simple. One of the best ways to think about that is if you stick your foot like in your car, underneath the brake pedal and you lift it up on the brake pedal from underneath it, you'd be working the front side of your muscles. So any activity that would allow you to sort of put pressure pulling up on your toes, as opposed to pushing the gas pedal down or pushing off or walking up a hill, we're constantly pushing off, pushing off, and that makes our calf bigger and it makes the front muscles in the leg weaker. That makes sense? So this is the big imbalance. There's this huge calf and these little tiny muscles in the front and there's a huge imbalance. Most of the time when someone has low back pain, I would go down and I would test the integrity or the strength of the muscles on the front side of the leg and I find that there's usually a significant weakness in comparison to the calf. So my job would be, let's bring the muscles in the front up to, to balance out or at least be as strong as the big calf muscle in the back. So it's a pretty cool concept. Um, how do you do that? Well, you can use a TheraBand, like an elastic band, and you can then kind of do toe-up exercises to make that muscle stronger. You can do that, which is a, a great, great strategy to, to make that happen. You can also, um, one of the other things that really helps that is to do, do proprioception muscles, uh, act, exercises, and that would be like to stand on your feet, easy to do, right? But if I took my, if I stood on one foot, you might go, okay, that's a little bit more difficult because now I'm actually feeling um, my ankle muscles moving and, and sort of wobbling and, and all of that. Now, if I put my arms out and I close my eyes, what's gonna happen is my balancing instead of my cerebellum is gonna go to my proprioceptive muscles in my foot, which are those little guys on the front of your leg. And those guys get activated when you balance yourself and you close your eyes. So as soon as you close your eyes, you're going to see, oh, wow, all of a sudden balancing becomes way more difficult. So closing your eyes, maybe while you're, if you have low back pain or weak ankles or knee problems or hip problems, then you have to activate those little proprioceptive muscles because we've been walking around in shoes for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Those muscles have lost their integrity. This is what causes bunions. If you ever look at somebody's toes and the toes are going out, the big toe sort of hangs the left and the right one sort of hangs the right, then that's because of the arch that broke down. And guess what muscles support the arch of your foot? It's those muscles on the front side. 
If they become weak, arch falls and you get a big bunion. You get that kind of hang a left or a hang a right with your big toe. These are classic indicators of your, your intrinsic proprioceptive muscles of the front of your leg breaking down. And who's gonna take over to slap from that? The big muscles on the back of your leg. And when they clamp down, they lock your knees and we tip forward and that's where we're gonna go next, okay? So one other technique you can use is something like this, like a, a, little, a little ball where you kind of stand on it with one leg and just trying to balance on that is a great proprioceptive exercise as well. So these things you can practice for a couple of minutes and, and, and really begin to build your proprioceptive strength. So many ways to do that, walking barefoot. Uh, I did a video exercise about barefoot running and how important that is to learn how to use your feet the way they were designed. I remember I was uh, in India doing some camps in the very remote regions of the Himalayan foothills, really close to the border of Nepal. And as you would walk into a village, we had all these herbs we were carrying because we were dispensing these herbs from these herbal companies in India who donated them. We were dispensing them to these villages. And as you'd walk into these little villages, we'd have two to three to 400 people maybe, like half the village would, would see someone coming into the village and they would all run to greet you because some, someone knew a stranger was coming to the village. So as we were walking in this one village, these kids saw us on the top of this hill and they started running down this mountain. It was a mountain of shale, rocks that were sort of sliding and moving under their feet. And these kids were just like storming and galloping down this mountain. And when they got down to us with big smiles on their face to greet us, I looked at their feet and they're all barefoot. I mean, they were literally running down a rock moving shale ridden mountain barefoot. And I looked at that and I was like, holy smoke, you know, how, how much, how, how lacking we are in the proprioception of our feet, that our feet really have lost, you know, their original design because of the kind of shoes that we've strapped on to protect our feet. It's really, really very interesting. And it's something that we really all should work on because a lot of it happens in the feet. After you do the strengthening exercises for the front of your leg against resistance with a TheraBand or some type of elastic band or tubing, that's when you want to then stretch out your calf. And the calf you would stretch out by doing just something like that. A simple stretch like that is fine. But the idea when you hold these stretches is you want to hold it for at least two minutes. When you hold a stretch for two minutes, the belly of the muscle, which is where all the blood is, and therefore all the scar tissue is, and all the crabgrass is, the muscles become super tight. And if you, if you just do a quick stretch, you're gonna pull the attachments where they attach to the bone. Those are called tendons. There's no elasticity in your tendons. But the belly of the muscles where the blood is, that's where we can put links in the chain, create elasticity. And if you put the muscle into a stretch, the belly will give up and allow it to lengthen. So a gentle, kind stretch for two minutes, painfully long, I know, but that's how you create permanent elasticity. That's how you put links in the chain. And maybe the very most important, you know, muscle to get links in the chain other than your calf muscle, because what happens is the next thing that happens is when this becomes, when these go back, what happens is two things tighten up. Well, one, you go forward here, but your IT bandage goes to the side of the leg and your quad muscles go tight because as you go forward, your pelvis tips like this. And when the pelvis tips, the quad muscle shortens. You see that? So if I, my, my, my legs here, if I'm standing up and my, my, my calves go tight, first it screws up your knees, number one, and my pelvis tips forward. As my pelvis forward, tips forward, my quads contract and my IT bands contract. Maybe the biggest secret for low back pain is to stretch out your quad. Um, this is something that I've done for years and you know, someone calls me on the phone, I can't move. I go, okay, here's what you do. Take, you grab, have someone grab your leg really gingerly and put it on the back of a chair like that and just hold it there and just sit there just like this and let this quad begin to relax a little bit at a time. And here you can stay in it for two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, just comfortably. If you want to push it, 
You can stretch it out like that a little bit. That's a great way of doing it as well. Um, and that's called a very simple quadriceps stretch or a thigh stretch. Super, super simple to do. Very easy to do, okay? So that's one thing that you can do that works really, really well to get the quads. And once this quad stretches out, this pelvis, instead of being pushed this way, this quad, if you open it up, it allows it to go back. So when you have your, your, your calves get tight and your tip forward, your low back has to go way into extension to get your head off the ground, and that creates a powerful overextension of your lower back. Does that make sense? Hope so. So when that happens, that creates a lot of problems. Now, if I can get these quads to release, my pelvis can come back. So instead of having my, my, my muscles of my spine pulling me back up, I have my pelvis just opening me back up. Does that make sense? It's such a cool thing and it works like a charm. It's so magical. Just take your leg up. A lot of people have like when they get in the car and they drive, they get sick. I always say if you have an SUV or, or stick your foot on the front hood of your car and before you go walking or take a break from driving, just sit there and just hold it just like this. Find a park bench, take a break if you're on a long drive. Whatever it takes to go like this, I recommend this for years and years and years. So incredibly effective just to get this to open up, okay? The next one is the IT band, which goes right up the side of the leg, right into the back of your lower back. And when that guy gets tight for the same exact reasons, you've got some real problems. So if the IT band is tight, you know, this can cause chronic low back pain and chronic knee pain. So these, these things I'm giving you right now are for both chronic knee pain and chronic low back pain. And you may have all heard of some of the techniques for the IT band. Uh, one of them is called the IT band roller. This is an IT band roller. It's a piece of styrofoam that actually um, you roll on. There's also uh, some more fancy ones that have knobs on them that hurt a lot more that you also roll on the side of your leg like that. And they work, they work really well as well. But basically when you, when, you do, when you do the rolling of your IT band, it's very, very simple. Um, you would just take the, take the roller and, um, and I'll try to do it here for you guys. Um, how can I do it here? So you take the roller and you just lie on your side like this and you just roll it very simply all the way up and all the way down just like that on the roller. You can also go onto your quad and roll on your quad the same way, just like that, and do the quad all the way up and all the way down. I can't go too far, I have a microphone in my pocket. Um, but uh, that's how you would do that. And trust me, um, the first time I did that, um, I thought I was gonna scream so loud that uh, they were gonna call an ambulance. I mean, it really, really hurt. And, and uh, these styrofoam rollers, you can see if this one has been used a lot, it's so really nice and squishy. So they're the ones you'd like to start with, or if you buy one at a store, um, sometimes they have these harder ones. You can wrap a towel around it, make it softer and cushier in the beginning. Um, these are great. I put this sometimes in my, in my, when I travel, because it sticks right in there, and I can roll it, uh, you know, if I'm in a hotel room after sitting in a plane, it works super, super well for that as well. So the IT bands, uh, the quadriceps, these are great, great strategies to get this to open up. Um, other techniques for the IT band is an exercise called the pigeon. If you Google the pigeon, um, I like what's called the upper pigeon, where you take your leg up like this onto a table, something like this, and then you put it here, and then you just lean forward. And when you lean forward, you're stretching the upper part of your IT band and you can just stretch that. And again, you wanna hold that for about two minutes, holding that upper pigeon exercise. Another super fantastic exercises, um, exercise. So we've got some pretty cool things working here, right? We've got, you know, stand on one leg and close your eyes and try to hold that for a minute while you're waiting for your toast to pop in the morning, your tea to boil in the morning or whatever. You can't stand on a little rubber uh, squiggly ball like that and try to balance on a, on a squiggly ball like that, which is great, and just balance and get your proprioceptive muscles to work. You can strengthen the front muscles of your leg here just by doing toe up exercises against resistance. Again, you would tie a, a band around your foot. It would go uh, 
over to a doorknob over there and you just you toe up exercises working and really exhausting these front muscles of your leg that's what you would do for that and after you strengthen this guy you want to stretch the back guy and that's where you would go into a calf stretch you know heels off a step or just do what i did and hold it for two solid minutes quad stretch to put it on the back of a chair or a bench or maybe the seat of your car if you have a higher suv or whatever stick the back of your leg there and just stretch that that quad up and then your it band roller the quad roller and you can also do um, you can also do the upper pigeon, I call it, okay? And then one more, which is my other thing that's important to realize, and you've probably all heard about this, is the psoas muscle, uh, which is your major hip flexor. It goes from the front of your lumbar spine right down to your pelvis, and whenever you bend over, it's a huge muscle that contracts. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, um, this muscle, when it gets into a spasm, it just pulls your lumbar spine forward and can cause all kinds of really deep chronic low back issues. And trying to get that guy stretched out is a bit of a trick because it's really far in there. So there's a couple of strategies that I like that work. And one, and my absolute favorite stretch, which does both your psoas muscle, your hip flexors, and some of the other ones in there, like your iliacus as well, as well as your quadricep. And this is maybe my favorite one of all. Um, and this is where you just take your, and this can be like on the side of your bed, really simple. You're on next to your bed. You wake up in the morning, you have some low back pain. As soon as you slide off the bed, you can do this one and just stand there for a minute. First thing in the morning and stretch out that quad. But why first before you even get out of the bed? And then you can do both sides like that, like that, and get that sort of, you know, get that sort of working for you in the morning. Sometimes getting out of bed for a lot of folks is tricky. It doesn't feel that great. Um, and then after you do that, you're still in bed. You take your other leg like this and you take it and you grab it like this and you put this leg here and then you come down and you stretch. As I'm coming down and stretching here, I'm stretching my quad and my psoas here and I'm really getting into this position just like this and I hold that um, for about two minutes. This is a great stretch because I can actually work on taking this foot further up and I can work on putting my pelvis down and my other leg I can pull it further and make just all kinds of flexibility strides in my pelvis that help open up all of those muscles there, which are really, really important. As we move up the spine, um, the middle back, um, in the shoulders and the neck become really vulnerable. And I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to tell you a couple of things about the neck and the shoulders that are, I think are really important. Again, same thing happens, you know, if the, if the muscles in the front of the leg become weak and the calf becomes tight, you, we're gonna go like this. We're gonna lock forward and we're gonna be tilted this way. These muscles in the upper back and neck are trying to pull this 20 pound head off the ground and we're gonna go into extension like that, okay? Create hyperextension just like that. This doesn't feel good. The same hyperextension we get in the lower back to come off same exact problem, okay? Neither one of those feel good. So what do we do about this guy when it comes up? Well, what happens is when these guys go up like that, over time, these little muscles, and they're not big, they're maybe that big, when they are constantly pulled, holding a 20 pound head off the floor for all these years, they get so tight, they lose blood, they lay down scar tissue, they lay down crabgrass, and they render the muscle non-elastic with increased resistance, and it takes a whole lot more effort for us to pull our head off the ground. So we get neck tension, headaches, neck pain, and guess what happens? Your trapezius muscles here, which are these huge muscles, they go from your shoulder up to your neck up here, and your shoulder down to your mid-back, it's a big, huge muscle, they just go in there and they just clamp down and they pull your head back like that for you. So your trap muscles, these guys go like that. Do you ever see people walking around like that all the time? That's because their traps, Hurts just thinking about that. That's because their traps are up like that. They're contracted because these muscles that were once supposed to keep your head up and then we're supposed to hold your head up. We're supposed to have this whole thing, this knees back, pelvis up and be actually in a position where 
the head sits on the spine versus having to be pulled up like that. So the, the, if you can follow me for a second, when the traps kick in and they grab onto the back of the neck, it causes tension in your, sp in your skull, underneath your, your, your occiput here, neck pain, and a whole bunch of tension. And as a result of that, the shoulders go up. And when the shoulders go up, your rotator cuff, which are back here, their muscles are supposed to pull your shoulder back and down, you see? That's what the rotator cuff does, is back and down. And the big trap muscles pull your shoulders up. So your rotator cuff sort of lets that happen in the name of keeping your head off the ground. And as a result, as a result, um, the rotator cuff springs and becomes vulnerable to a shoulder injury, which is really common. And the trap muscles just clamps on for dear life and causes a lot of pain. So I want to teach you one of my favorite exercises that I was taught a long time ago, um, and uh, which is about how to release your trapezius muscle, which is not an easy task. And this is one of the exercises that can really unravel a lot of chronic shoulder issues and a lot of chronic neck issues. So really, really important. So what you do is you take a yoga strap like this and you stick it through your, your, your leg and then you would take and put it over your shoulder like this and you would cinch it down just like I'm doing here. And as I'm cinching it down, my shoulder is sort of is pinning my shoulder down and pinning my trap down. So now what I do with my hand, my other hand is I come around and I grab my head and I just pull my head this way. And instantly I feel a huge stretch right here in this trap muscle that goes right up into my head. And here again, you hold that just like that and you hold it for, it feels so good. And you hold it for how many minutes? That's right, two solid minutes. Really super easy to get that to open up. Really simple and that, you do that every day, a couple times a day. My goodness, what a powerful, powerful tool to do. And you can do that on both sides. It's really simple. Just all you need is a, a simple yoga strap like this. And uh, just take it put, your, put it, put your foot through it. You wrap it around your shoulder like this. And then you pull your head this way. Hold it for two minutes. Super, super simple to get these guys to relax. Two more things, and then I'm going to uh, answer some questions here with regard to the neck. The neck has two types of problems. The neck can become very straight and very rigid as a result of it can become hyperextended, or the muscles in the spine can become so tight they actually straighten out the actual spine so there's no curve. Um, so there's two types of tractions that work really well. One traction is to lengthen your neck, you know, make it longer, and that's sort of the chronic relief when you think of traction, it makes your neck longer. And there's some really cool, simple ones you can get even on Amazon that are like, um, where you have little things over a door and they have little water pulleys that hang, have to pull your neck up and pull water on one side so your neck is being sort of stretched and tractioned up and there's a big piece of some water, like a big um, uh, bag of water that is like weighted and it helps to kind of open up your neck and they work great. You know, a little bit of traction to open up those vertebra goes a really long way. The other problem is that the spine loses its, its curve. When the, when, when the curve of the neck is supposed to be something like that and when there's a nice curve, there's nice big holes for the nerves to come out and the arteries to go through. But when the, when, the, when the spine starts to flatten out, those holes for the nerves and the arteries get really super small. And that's a problem as we age, right? And um, so there are, there's a technique, a, a tool that I love. I, I think I must have used four or five of these in the last 10 years. Um, I, I discovered this when I was working with the New Jersey Nets. And this is a little device that is super simple. Um, what you do here, if you were lying on your back, you would lie on your back and you would put this you know, underneath your chin. And then what would happen here is your chin would be kind of strapped in, holding your chin here, and this is your neck. And this thing would pump up 
here and sort of pump your neck up, pushing it into, pushing that straight spine into a curve. So it brings that curve back. Um, super simple to do. I'll give you a quick little demonstration of how to do that. But uh, all you do is you just lie on it, lie on it like this, pull the, push the little button, let the air out. And then you take the strap, put it over your head, and you, um, and you just put these little Velcro straps right over you like this. And then you just pump it up. Um, I lost my strap here. And you just pump it up until you get a really nice curve put back. And as soon as you feel a little tension, you stop and hold it there and you can let it out. And you can just start to massage your neck up and down to create some elasticity in your neck. And um, I can't even tell you how valuable this has been for me in my life. I was in a couple of car accidents and had some neck injuries. And, and um, you know, you go to one chiropractor after another and, and you get sort of frustrated spending half your time in doctor's offices and it, it just becomes too much. And, and uh, you know, I've been actually giving these to my patients for years because they don't have to see me. You know, if you really want to get your neck rehabbed, you got to do this kind of thing every day. And to go into a chiropractor's office every day is just cost prohibitive and it takes too much time. So the idea is that you can do something like these things that I gave you every single day to bring your posture back into balance, repair yourself from injury, and really bring back a level of self-sufficiency. So it's a very, very cool, uh, very, very cool way to, to take responsibility back for your health. Clearly, though, if you are in trouble, you know, seeing a, a good chiropractor or a good massage therapy that does, that does active release technique or, or, or muscle activation technique or acupuncture, these are all powerful tools that I think can work really well to help you out. But at the end of the day, you want to have something that you can do once you're out of harm's way to keep yourself balanced. And these techniques, even if they, even if they don't, you know, they may be enough to get you out of pain, but in addition, Maybe even more importantly, there are the preventative things we can do as part of our daily routine to protect ourselves. Because you know these muscles here get weaker, and the big guys in the back of our calf get strong, get bigger, bigger and tighter and stronger, and that creates up a center of gravity issue that that now it makes gravity twice as difficult for us to uh, endure and protect against. All right, so I'm going to answer some questions here, and I'll be right back. Okay, so um, questions here. If anybody has a question, I would love you to push star uh, two now and I'll answer your questions for you. Uh, a couple of questions here, one from Vancouver. Um, thanks for this podcast. I broke my ankle and required surgery 10 weeks ago. It's not unlocking in the physio, uh, and in physio the pain is unbearable. My foot aches in varying degrees of pain, pretty much steady. I'm tolerant. Most of the pain is challenging. You know, here again, you know, those proprioceptive exercises that I gave you are so important for that. You know, just standing on one foot and closing your eyes and you watch your foot and your ankle start to wobble, you'll break up that scar tissue. You break an ankle, you're gonna lay down protective scar tissue. It's gonna render that muscle completely rigid. I'll tell you a story, Billie Jean King, I, when she did the forward to my book, I got to know her pretty well. Maybe the most amazing person, woman I've ever known. Just absolutely, uh, I'm a huge fan. And she was playing Wimbledon one year and she told me and she said that she, she fell and she slid on her big toe, like went bent backwards and she slid like 10 feet across the court. And it was a really bad injury and they pulled her off the court and one doctor said you should immobilize it and one doctor said you should mobilize it. And it was a lot easier for her to immobilize it because it hurt like heck to mobilize it. So she immobilized it. And she said that she had been basically not able to walk off of her foot straight since that day, 20, 30 years ago, when I got to see her. 
Uh, and and so and I when I felt and worked on her big toe, it was so completely frozen, like with scar tissue and crabgrass everywhere. So I broke it up with my fingers and got it to move. And when I, after I fixed it, she said it was the first time she was able to take a step off the front of her big toe without having to go off to the side. When she would take a step, she'd have to sort of take a little side step because she couldn't actually walk straight over her big toe. She had to sort of walk around it. That's sort of what's happening to you, I think, is there's an injury there and that can become uh, a real problem. Another question, uh, how can we alleviate chronic pain from degenerative disc disease? Yoga is incorporated, turmeric every day. Um, do I exclude as many inflammatory foods? Well, yeah, you know, the foods for sure, eating a clean diet, it makes a huge difference in terms of how inflamed you are. You know, turmeric mixed with black pepper, 16 parts turmeric, one part black pepper is powerfully as an anti-inflammatory. Fish oils, boswellia, has shown to be 10 times more as an anti-inflammatory than turmeric and fish oils put together, and that's how fish oils and turmeric got famous, was their anti-inflammatory benefit, all right? So, so really, you know, boswellia is something that I'm just, and I love it because it breaks up that scar tissue and creates self-sufficiency versus dependency, which is really a cool thing. Um, however, um, you know, a lot of what I talked about over there are the biomechanical postural issues that cause the disc to generate in the first place. When you put that much chronic stress, whether the, because of the posture and the back is being pulled into extension and left there for a period of time, and then you get an injury on top of that, it becomes sort of chronic degeneration and you got to take off the musculoskeletal uh, stress. It's sort of like a rope and pulley system. If you think about the muscles in the leg, calf versus the front of your leg, they're a rope and pulley system. And if one rope is st really strong, the other guys are gonna give up. And that's gonna create a complete change in how the knee, where the knee is actually positioned, right? And then that muscle is gonna, that's gonna create a complete change in terms of the calf, the uh, quads and your hamstrings. And that's gonna take a huge change in your pelvis. It's all ropes and pulleys. So what we're trying to do is balancing the ropes and pulleys. Yoga is great, but it should be specific yoga for your specific weak link. General yoga can sometimes make you worse because you've got a specific rope and pulley problem. And what I laid out there, you can watch this video again and again, those are the common ones. And if you fix those, you don't hurt anything and people don't have any problems. And that's why I'm sharing those with you because they're the ones that have been foolproof for me clinically for all these years. Um, what would you suggest for adequate resistance training without too much um, equipment or no equipment? Um, uh, good question. Um, I think that there are different versions of the Lifeline gyms, those elastic tubings. I think those are you know, pretty good, actually. I think they work really well. I think there's some um, really good Pilates videos that you can get that are um, that really work your musculus, your strength um, without actually doing resistance and they're pretty cool. Some of the, some of the floor exercise in Pilates I find to be really, really quite brilliant uh, and, and, and they work yeah, uh, physically as well. So they might be a, a good strategy. And of course, yoga can be that way as well, um, as well, although it tends to be a little bit more on the flexibility side. I have a, a neck pain for 30 years, uh, the last 15, it's been called fibromyalgia, it involves uh, other muscles as well. Um, uh, sometimes calcium supplements will help. Uh, would you please help me? What foods, diet can I eat? Strong vata type. Okay, so what fibromyalgia is, is fibrous tissue in the muscles, right? A muscle gets tight, loses blood supply, lays down protective fibrous tissue or crabgrass, which doesn't require any blood, but it's non elastic, rigid, and brittle. So now, if I start laying that throughout my whole body, my whole body becomes non elastic, rigid, and brittle. So, how do I get rid of that? Well, I gotta break up that scar tissue. Well, gentle movement, yoga, tai chi, walking, um, gentle uh, uh, movement that we have to move for sure. Doing things like basuela to get the, the, the break up the scar tissue. Herbs for your lymphatic flow, like mangista, a great lymphatic mover. Turmeric is a great lymphatic mover. Brahmi is a great lymphatic mover. All of these herbs are great. Fish oils are also good. Vitamin D, another deficiency that affects 87% of the world's population. I think maybe the, when I got my vitamin D optimized, because optimized means over 50, and mine was like 35 when I first tested it 10 years ago, 
I think the biggest thing that I felt, well, I felt like my joints were 10 years younger. So if you haven't gotten your vitamin D optimized in between 50 and 60 and 70 and 80, that's where you want to be, then, and you're having joint issues, you, you got to fix that because vitamin D over 50, over 45 actually, starts acting like a hormone, the most powerful secrosteroid hormone in your body. And it has powerful, natural, anti-inflammatory joint relieving t uh, strength ability. So it's just phenomenal for that. And it's, it's tons of studies to, to back that up. Um, a diet for, for getting rid of uh, inflammation, for sure, a non-inflammatory diet, which first, first and foremost is get rid of the sugar, get rid of the processed food, which means cooked oils. When you cook an oil and you put it in a package, you throw it on the counter and it's got cooked anything, breads all have oils that have been cooked, crackers of bread, potato chips, all those are cooked rancid oils and they are inflammatory. So whole food diet. It's not that meat is particularly bad. A lot of it is three times a day. It was never the gen our genetics, but a little bit of meat. If you take the hunter or the uh, the centenarian people who live over 100 years old on average, they eat 10 percent of their diet is animal protein, and they eat beans at every single meal. And beans are powerful. Uh, high protein, high fiber agents, and the fiber is a, is a powerful detoxifier because it grabs onto the toxins in the bile and escorts it to the toilet. So that's, uh, that's really, really important. Um, okay, so those are some of the questions there. If you have any questions um, uh, on the phone, I'd love to hear from you. I got a couple of people. I have one from um, Chicago. Are you there? From Chicago, Illinois, are you there? Yeah, I can, great. Yeah, um, so I had a strange situation happen to me. I'm 62, I'm really, you know, rough food, vegan, I work out, and one day in October, I went to stand up and I couldn't put any weight on my left ankle. And so far I've been to podiatrists, orthopedic surgeon, you know, steroid shot, everything they x-rays, there's no stress fracture, nothing broken, but still six months later, <laughs> I still have problems uh, with my ankle. So you, you still can't put any weight on it? I, it's like 85% better, but like I still use a cane and I'm still kind of limping and uh, you know, normally I do like Bikram yoga, and yeah. that I put a brace on to try to go to yoga class and not do, you know, the standing on the one uh, so, on my left side. But it's it's just a mystery. Like they don't know why. Where's the pain? What's causing it? It's in my left ankle. Where? Uh, right. You know, at the joint where you bend it. On the inside or the outside? Uh. Like in the middle of the joint? Uh, no, on the outside next to the ankle bone. Okay. So, and I've had several x-rays, no stress fracture. I mean, I've had like 10 x-rays and they can't find anything. And I didn't do anything. Like I didn't trip or fall or I don't wear high heels. So, so this I didn't do anything. So this is probably one of two things. And uh, when I was with the New Jersey Nets, one of the players um, would have these, his, his knees were so beat up that little pieces of bone would sort of fall off and, and they would float around the joint capsule and every once in a while, the little piece of bone would get stuck into the joint. And he couldn't, it, it would freeze him up to the point where like he'd be on the court playing and it would be carry the guy off the court. And I remember one time we carried him off at halftime and carried him off the court and I said okay you know we had a pretty good suspicion it was like a foreign loose body in his knee and I had a couple of the trainers hold his 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 uh, thigh muscle, his thigh his leg on the top you know his big thigh and then I had a couple of guys hold his ankle and we stretched out his joint and opened it up and pulled it and I was in the middle as they were pulling as hard as they could I was sort of rotating the knee joint his best, it's really slowly trying to work this foreign body out of his knee. And then as we got it out of there, we let it back down and pain seemed to go away. We taped him back up and he played the rest of the game. Went right back on the court and played the rest of the game. 
that's the kind of pain that you get when you have a foreign body, a loose body in the, in, in the, uh, in the joint. It was a pretty cool sort of barbaric thing, but it was pretty cool. And after the end of the year, he played through this the whole season that way. We did it a couple of times and he was able to uh, get a surgery. At the end of the year, he had 28 little foreign pieces of bone floating around in, in his joint capsule that every once in a while got stuck in, his, in, in between the joint and froze it up. Um, so that's something that they have to sort of look for. It might be something floating around like that. And I had one, one of our guys had the same thing in his ankle. Um, and uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing it could be is that there's muscles that wrap around the back of that uh, about ankle bone there, the, 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 the medial malleolus is called. And if those muscles, like think about our rope and pulley system for a second, right? If those muscles are pulling really, really tight, they can push that bone and create chronic inflammation there. So what I would suggest you do is, is uh, now this is on the medial side right here, so that's probably the posterior tibial muscle. So what I would probably do is have somebody, uh, really sounds really crazy to diagnose this, but I got a hunch that it might help you. If you get in there and have somebody really massage on the inside of your shin bone, okay? on the inside of your shin bone, that probably is really sore if you dig up in there, dig in there across that whole bone. And that's the meat of the belly of that muscle that wraps around that medial ankle bone. And, if, and so what you wanna do is you wanna create some elasticity in the belly of that muscle to kind of put a few links in the chain so it stops yanking on that medial malleolus or that medial ankle bone. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's a rope and a pulley system. Maybe your calf muscle is too tight. Something's pulling too tightly. A good active release doc should be able to figure out what rope is pulling too tight and where the strain is. This should be a pretty simple fix. Once you find the problem, and, and the good news is it's not a broken bone. They've ruled out all these really severe things. It's probably something really simple. And unfortunately, you know, the medical docs don't see that on an x-ray, so they're not going to notice it. All right. And where would I find an active, active? If you go to activerelease.com, activereleasetechnique.com, they've got a list of doctors and practitioners, uh, and even trainers, people who actually teach the seminars on their website. You can call them directly from there. It's called activereleasetechnique.com. And is there any supplement I should take? Well, I would definitely be thinking about making sure you're up to speed with your vitamin D, making sure a boswella is a really great herb because that will actually break up the scar tissue. And once you do the muscle work, then all those boswellic acids will penetrate that joint and establish elasticity for you, which is really, really important. And this is also a big one. Stretch out that calf. Strengthen those front guys I talked about in the video. You saw me doing that, right? Yes. Okay, so do those things as well, okay? Sound good? Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, my, ple my pleasure. Good luck to you. I'm going to hang up and go on to the next caller from uh, uh, Williamston, uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts. Are you there? In Williamstown, are you there? Williamstown, hello? Hello, Williamstown? Hello? Hello? Anyway, I'm going to mute her back because I think she's uh, talking to somebody else. Um, and let's see here. Do I have any other questions? I guess I do here. Uh, I'm a licensed acupuncturist and a registered yoga teacher. I um, very much enjoy the long three to five minute holes in a yin yoga posture. So I often recommend two to three minute stretches of my patients. However, if I ask them to do two minutes, I, I realistically expect them to do it for 30 to 45 seconds. Do you recommend people use a timer? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. It's so true, right? You know, two minutes is like a marathon. It's like a year holding a posture, holding a stretch. And I, and I would highly suggest that you, you know, um, you put a little timer on your phone and just now everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a timer right there, super handy, and just hold it for that two solid minutes. It'll make a difference. It'll get you to the point where you don't have to do it every single day a whole lot quicker. And that's the strategy that I use for them. But yeah, great question. I am being blown away by the fact this is exactly what I'm going through right now. This is amazing. Okay, that's not a question, but thank you. 
Uh, can you talk about thoracic outlet sy uh, syndrome from an Ayurvedic perspective? Well, thoracic outlet is sort of what I talked about from a biomechanical perspective, how you know the posture creates the head to drop down, these muscles go up, the traps take over, and then when the traps take over, the rotator cuff springs, and some of those, one of those rotator cuff muscles are just hanging on for dear life, they're gonna entrap a, a nerve and cause a rotator cuff situation, a very simple thing. Um, from the Ayurvedic perspective, I worked with Ayurvedic doctors in India who did chiropractic adjustments, who did really deep massage, and there was definitely an understanding, not as sophisticated as maybe what we're talking about, exact muscles, but there was definitely an understanding of the biomechanics and the treatment of the biomechanics from an Ayurvedic perspective. In addition to that, there's no doubt that poor diet, poor digestion, and most importantly, poor lymphatic drainage, which drains through the musculoskeletal system, can definitely set you up for an exacerbation of a postural imbalance. Your posture gets out of whack because of sitting or, or standing or overuse or injury, then poor diet and therefore poor lymphatic flow is going to set you up. And that's what our, our podcast next month is going to be at. You're not going to want to miss this. It's all about some absolutely amazing research that's brand new that's really leading, lending so much credibility to what Ayurveda knew for so long, which is the very first system we treat, which is the lymph. So in that regard, all the lymphatic movers, the green, the, 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 the green drinks and the raspberries and the strawberries and the blueberries and the cherries and the beets and the cranberries and the pomegranates, all the stuff that makes your, that makes dye and makes your, dyes and turns your shirt pink when you spill on it. Um, that is exactly what you want to be having. Herbs like Mangista as a lymphatic mover, turmeric as a lymphatic mover, Brahmi Brain as a lymphatic mover. We have one called Lymph Vein HP as a lymphatic mover. These are all the things you take, which is basically the lymph vein is basically an extract of the white pith or the peel of an orange which has a chemical in it called diosmin, which I remember being in India and grinding up or drying out and scraping off pomegranate and mango and orange peels and drying them and grinding them into a powder for blood pressure, which is basically you know, poor lymphatic drainage. So now we have an herb that's been shown scientifically to be a powerful microcirculation lymphatic mover. Pretty, pretty cool. A couple more questions. If you guys have to go, I know it's been an hour. We had a little technical issue. So I'm going to continue to answer a few more questions before we wrap up here. And if you have to go, I totally understand. Thank you for listening. And um, definitely see you next month with our lymphatic um, uh, podcast. If you don't have any particular ache or pain, I suffer from unexplained weight loss. I love Dr. R's approach to med medical conditions and the teaching. So uh, I, I will learn a lot tonight. I have a, I have a clarification to ask in regards to use of silica to support collagen, muscle tissue in general. What kind of supplements could be taken in combination and with other vitamins and minerals? You know, I, I think the other piece of the puzzle from a nutritional point of view, silica can be very, very good because it provides micro support and supports the collagen uh, of the joints, which is very, very valuable. And, and um, you know, um, the other piece of the puzzle is um, minerals. You know, most, I think in one study in 1948 or 46, I think it was, that every American was deficient in at least one mineral back then. Only now, with the soils being depleted and things, we're, we're even way worse than that. So I am a really big fan and take a, 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 a one a day multi mineral supplement that's super highly absorbable. I believe that's a really very, very valuable piece of the puzzle that I didn't mention. We have a product called Essential Minerals, which is a, a really great product for um, giving you all the nutritional needs you met, needs, needs, get them all your nutritional needs met. You don't need to take a ton of this stuff. You take one a day and forget about it. The stuff lasts you forever. It's, it's, it's just baseline support. You don't, you know, when you take a multi-mineral, multi-vitamin, they, they act as if you never eat anything. And, and you know, you don't need to overwhelm yourself with that kind of stuff. Hi, Dr. John, I'm 65 years old, never really leg or knee injuries, but lately it seems like my, uh, it seems um, left, right movement can bother my knee. I'm overweight. Uh, I can walk and bike fine. I want to keep my joints working smoothly, but after dropping some pounds, what else can I do? Okay, when you have when you when your knee starts to wobble there, 
um, and becomes a little fragile. This is lack of blood supply. When the knee gets really big, ever see people as we get older, the knees start to get really big? That's because, remember what I said, like if you have a muscle here, right, and I contract that muscle, the muscles have to slide amongst each other. But if I have scar tissue in between that muscle, when I contract it, it's gonna take a lot more work to contract that muscle. And when you make muscles work harder, they get bigger. That's what weightlifters do. They pump muscles up and they get bigger. So when your muscles in your knee are working so hard that they get bigger, that's because you've lost elasticity, you've built up scar tissue, and you have lack of blood supply in that area. So what has to happen is we gotta get in there and break up that scar tissue. Get in there and break it up. All the stuff that I told you about the biomechanics and the posture, critically important, but you probably need somebody to get in there either with active release or, or, or muscle activation technique and, or a massage therapist. Get, really get in there and put the blood back into that joint capsule. That's critically important important. I hope that, hope that helps you because I've seen so many patients who are elderly who have knee issues and they can't walk or exercise and it's just devastating and you put a little blood back in that joint, get some elasticity back, put, give them some good therapy exercises that are specific for their condition and they're back in business. Um, so it, it, it's, it's important, amazing really how quickly the body can heal and recover. Um, I reviewed your Basuela joint formula and its ingredients. The formula looks great. However, I have gallstones and decided not to take turmeric, uh, which is one of the ingredients. I wonder why you've been advised not to take turmeric. You have gallstones. Um, gallstone, turmeric is a natural bile mover. Maybe because it has oxalic acids, which I don't think is a good reason. Because it, be, if that's what you're thinking, if it has oxalates, I don't think that's a good reason not to take turmeric because you need to increase bile flow. Um, and the amount of turmeric that's in there is actually a very, very small amount, and it's a driver for the Basuela. So the cool thing about the Basuela formula we have, it's a Basuela acids, turmeric, ashwagandha, and ginger. And those all together make the Basuela, which is a resin, sort of from the frankincense family, easy to absorb. Otherwise, it's very hard to get them to absorb. And that's exactly what um, you know, the traditional way of formulating herbs was all, all about. I really wouldn't worry about it, um, but I would also look at other strategies and read about my stuff about gallstones and increasing bile flow because that's you know uh, something really really important because your bile is your Pac-Man to gobble up all the yuck and keep the inflammation down and that can set you up for problems as well. Does inflammation cause idiopathic urticaria? Um, I tried e using turmeric uh, for it and. Um, and felt relief in my knees, but not my hives. And then I worried about uh, the yellow staining of my teeth. I ordered Dr. Best curcumin. Can you overuse curcumin? I'd appreciate your input on this problem. I have, and I've taken, I currently take allergy shots. Allergy shots can be a good strategy if they work for you. Um, you know, when you have rashes, I wanna know why I have the rash. Hives are usually lymphatic issues. Turmeric properly prepared with black pepper can be very valuable. Um, curcumin, again, you know, extracts of herbs, they're medicines and they work, but you want to get on them, get off and get better and get off of them quickly. Whole herbs have the microbiology from the plant and the soil. They have, when you blend them with like black pepper, they increase the absorption by 2000% according to the science, which is powerful, as effective as curcumin, but you get all the benefits of the whole herb and none of the detriments of using an extract, which is when the body starts to become dependent or, 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 or it builds what's called tolerance to the herb and doesn't work as well. Turmeric is a great herb. Curcumin is a great herb. However, I would prefer, always prefer using the whole herb. And if I get really sick, then I might go to something like a, like a, a medicine like curcumin for a short period of time to, to give the body the medicine before the body becomes used to the medicine and the medicine stops working. Same with garlic. You take garlic every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Then when you really need it, it doesn't have the power for the boost or the oomph that it needs. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So um, I would suggest in this case, if you've got you know, um, some hives and some skin irritation, I would look at the intestinal skin. I'd look at the lymph around the intestinal skin. I would look at herbs to support the intestinal skin and the lymph like brahmi, amalaki, neem, and mangista. That's what I would look at first 
and I probably wouldn't take turmeric right away because it can be a little bit heating. Um, and, um, and not always my first choice for, for this, when the skin's really raging. Hope that makes sense. Um, it's just a little finesse thing that you learn clinically over the years. Hi, Dr. Diard. Thank you for doing this podcast. My name is Persia. I'm a student. I have inflammatory arthritis, autoimmune disease. I really painful hands, wrists, elbows. You know, this what I hear, autoimmune conditions, painful wrists. I go, you know what? You got to listen to my podcast next month about lymph. We're going to get into that in detail. That's really going to be an important piece of the puzzle. Yes, right now when you have arthritis, this is a systemic issue. It comes from digestion, comes from lymphatic congestion. Um, herbs like boswellia will get after that locally. Vitamin D helps locally. Fish, fish oils, turmeric, all these things are really great locally. An herb called Google is a great detoxifier. We have one called Googleine, detoxifies the joints. All these are going to be really good. But at the end of the day, and I, and I suggest Persia doing that, but at the end of the day, I would suggest we really dig in, um, really dig in and get to the cause of that and really run a fine tooth comb through your intestinal skin and your efficiency and your ability to digest well. Okay. Um, this uh, next question, I, read, I just read something about vitamin D deficiency can cause the pain in the sternum and pressure uh, and when pressure is applied um, and, 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 and can cause pain in and around the sternum. Had an ultrasound to rule out breast issue, found nothing. Just started my vitamin D self and surprising the pain has pretty much disappeared. Again, just like I said earlier, uh, you know, uh, Carol from New Jersey, um, you know, a great confirmation of that vitamin D is, a, is one of the most powerful um, agents to support joint elasticity and muscle elasticity. I can't tell you how effective it is, particularly if you're low. And a lot of times these, these issues happen in the winter when you're sort of a little vitamin D deficient and then they take it and you feel a, a whole lot better. Uh, and also, before I move on from that, protein deficiencies can be a cause of joint problems and chronic issues in the winter as well. So be aware of that and read my free ebook on are you protein deficiency deficient? If you're like a vegan vegetarian and you're sort of wondering if I'm getting enough protein, read that ebook. It's a whole bunch of really cool information about how a lack of protein um, can actually cause some joint issues. Uh, I had a car accident and I have more aches and pains than ever in my life. Help. I'm so sorry to hear that. So, so you know, again, this is, you know, when you go into a car accident and the whole body is in trauma and there's kind of tension of all the muscles and all the muscles lose blood and all the muscles lay down scar tissue uh, to protect themselves and you lose a level of elasticity and you sort of walk around a little on the brittle side, this has to get unraveled. And this is where things like hot Epsom salt baths and massage and basuela and turmeric and the anti-inflammatory diet, all of it chips in. But definitely massage, daily massage. If you can't get someone to do it, use our Ayurvedic lymphatic massage oil and massage that into your body every day. Very, very important. Um, from Maria and from New Haven, thanks for this event, this information. I uh, am sure you will cover this, but um, uh, what are your go-to supplements to reduce inflammation? Um, also, I have a cycle going on where exercise causes inflammation, which causes stiffness and pain. If exercise less, of course it lessens. I feel much better with 30 minutes a day. So, so what happens here? There's a classic sign when you, when you exercise and it makes you feel better, then you have, and your, and your muscles get warmed up and you start to feel better. This is muscular stuff where the muscles are really tight and rigid. You increase circulation, you feel a little better. If you exercise and you feel better during and then after everything clamps down, this is a circulation issue. This everything, you know, it feels good, but then it goes right back to where it was and you've lost lymphatic flow. And that's where, you know, doing things like the anti-inflammatory diet, the herbs for inflammation, Boswellia, Mangista, Turmeric Plus, these, all these herbs make really, really good sense. Absolutely optimize your vitamin D levels. If you don't know your vitamin D levels and you're not sure what to do, we have a home test kit. You can just prick your finger, squeeze it down. We'll send you the results back. Um, the lab sends it to us, we send it to you. 
and then uh, you'll know if you're 20, 30, or 40, and I'll send that to you with a recommendation of how to get you between 50 and 80, which is the optimal level dose that you want to have. Uh, do you have any experience or advice for someone with frozen shoulder? Um, uh, advice, uh, advice, for, advice for when the pain is increased, stiff, stiffness in advance. Um, I, I have tons of advice for frozen. I've treated so many frozen shoulders over the years and it's basically an exacerbation of what I talked about. When the muscles get tight and the rotator cuff clamps down, like I said, when, that, when, the, when the neck gets tight like that and the traps go up like that and the rotator cuff springs, then, the, then somebody's got to hold the shoulder together and those muscles are going to start to clamp down and you got the trap pulling up and you got the rotator cuff pulling down and you got yourself a frozen shoulder. It's that simple. I don't treat that personally anymore, um, um, but I would highly suggest you find someone who really has experience with that because it's very doable, takes a little bit of work, but you know, a good muscle activation technique therapist or a um, active release person, good chiropractor, that or massage therapist has trained in that can, can unravel that for you, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, what do you think of turmeric, arnica, um, and infrared sauna for pain management? I think turmeric with black pepper is fantastic. I think arnica has value. I, I, I haven't, I've used it for pain a lot myself and I don't know, I don't, I don't see it work fantastic for me, but I have heard so many stories and read so much about it that I, I know it has a lot of value. Infrared sauna can be very good. Again, it's all about that. Only the, how that works is it increases blood supply. You're increasing, putting the blood back, and when the blood comes back, which is your lubricant, better good things happen. So you want to be thinking about things to increase blood supply without damage. So over exercise can can increase blood supply. You feel good, but then you have inflammation from the wear and tear. So it's a kind, gentle approach. And, and, and one of my favorite ways to know of how much exercise is good, how much is not so good, is with the nasal breathing. Because the nose breathing, when you're breathing deep in and out through your nose, you're creating a, a, a depth of breath that allows you to stay in parasympathetic dominance. And if you start to <gasps> breathe through your mouth, upper chest, you go into fight or flight, run from a bear, save your life dominance. And that's a stressful inflammatory chemistry but the nose breathing long, slow, and deep is anti-inflammatory chemistry. It's really cool and really simple, and definitely read up on some of my workouts using nasal breathing exercise. If you haven't heard about that, my whole book, first book, Body, Mind, and Sports, all about that. Lots of free articles about how to actually do that, so check that out on my website as well. Um, from Chicago, since October, my left ankle has been inflamed to the point that I had to use canes and crutches there's no explanation according to that x-ray. So I think that's the girl I just spoke to for Chicago. It is, yeah. I just answered her question on the phone. Um, does inflammation cause idiopathic luticaria? Uh, this is the same exact question that I had before as well. Um, yes. So. I think I've answered all your questions. Thank you all very much. I'm gonna take a quick snoop over here. And I think I've got all the questions and answered all the phone calls. So um, yeah, I think we are good to go. Um, thank you all for listening. And uh, please don't miss our next podcast, which is next month. And that's going to be on March 14th. Mark your calendars. Uh, at 5.30, the brain lymph connection for better mood and memory. And it's going to be a lot more than about mood or memory because we're going to talk about the whole lymphatic system and how it all works. So it's going to be pretty, a pretty cool lecture that I can't wait to have. So until then, have a great month and we'll talk to you soon.